have a Bible and you want to open up to uh, John chapter 19, I'm going to read a portion of it to you. And I want you to notice something if you are one who has a red letter edition Bible as we read this portion. We're going to begin in verse 12, 19, verse 12 through 16. From then on, and we'll talk about what happened before this in just a moment. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews, not all Jewish people, but the Jewish religious leaders, cried out saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he, speaking of Pilate, delivered him, speaking of Jesus, to them, speaking of the crucifiers, to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Father, these words capture what happened just before, just moments before the crucifixion of our Lord. Father, we ask that you would enable us to enter in, to understand, yes, even to feel what was happening here. and what Jesus accomplished by subjecting himself to this. And we will thank you tonight, and we will thank you forever for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I mentioned that if you have a red-letter edition, I wanted you to notice something in the negative. Notice what isn't there. And what I just read, red ink. This isn't the point of the message, but I just think it's something that you just, along with me, that we should think about. This is crunch time. And he didn't say a word. Wow. Wow. We've been considering Jesus' trials now for a multitude of weeks. Jesus' trials before, number one, the Jewish religious leaders, Annas, then Caiaphas, and then his Roman trials before Pilate, and then Herod, and then back to Pilate. Lest we forget what was going on, I haven't been in this pulpit on Thursday night for two weeks, and it feels like an eternity for me. Lest we forget what was going on, the Jews wanted Jesus dead. And what do we also, what do we also know about that? He had, they had wanted that for a long time. Very early in his ministry, they were already scheming to get Jesus dead. Jesus first stood in these trials before Annas, and if you remember, he was, as I said, sort of the godfather of the Jewish priesthood, which had degenerated into something of an organized crime syndicate. Annas was not the official high priest at the time, but the old man still had control. So he was involved. It was his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who was the official high priest. By the way, in those days of this time in Jesus' life, who 
determined who was the official high priest? The Romans. It says something about the, how the high priesthood had degenerated. Jesus was too much for Annas. Annas couldn't handle Jesus, so Jesus was shuffled off to stand trial before Caiaphas. It's interesting, the trial before Caiaphas in this text of the Gospel of John, John says precious little about Jesus before Caiaphas, but the other three Gospels fill in the blanks, and we took one week to kind of go over those to see about the trial before Caiaphas. The Jews wanted Jesus dead. I know you remember that because I keep telling you, but they didn't want to execute Jesus themselves. So they plotted, and the Bible tells us that they plotted and schemed. They plotted to get the Romans to do their dirty work for them. The Jewish charges against Jesus were religious, no doubt, obviously. What else would they be? The charges were blasphemy. He, being a man in their eyes, nothing but a man, but making himself to be equal with God by calling himself the Son of God. Now, the Jews knew that the Romans didn't, weren't going to care one whit for any of that. So the Jews trumped up some civil charges that they hoped would bait the Roman governor Pilate into having Jesus executed. Interestingly, Pilate didn't want to get mixed up in any of this. He just wanted, A, to keep the peace, and B, to keep the tax revenues rolling in. Why? Because, C, he wanted to keep his job. That was the whole thing. Pilate wasn't hesitant to execute Jesus because he believed in Jesus. He didn't care about Jesus. He just didn't want to be bothered. When Pilate heard that Jesus was a Galilean, he thought, oh, good, I'm going to get out of this. He saw his chance to pass the buck to Herod, the son, one of the sons of Herod the Great, the son of Herod the Great, who uh, was the, Herod the Great's the one who was killing the babies in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Jesus stood trial very briefly before Herod, but that didn't go anywhere, and so Jesus was shuffled back to Pilate. Pilate just picked up where he left off, trying to weasel out of the execution. In our opening text, opening verse of tonight's text, verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. I'm going to comment on that in just a moment. But this wasn't the beginning of his desire to release him. He tried to weasel out of executing Jesus. And if you'll allow me to be redundant, because he didn't want to be involved, not because he believed in Jesus, cared about Jesus, or anything close to it. Last time we ended with verses 10 and 11, Pilate was taunting Jesus, I believe, asking Jesus, why aren't you afraid of me? Don't you know I have the power for you to die and the power for you to live? And of course, Jesus, who was in complete control and has all power in heaven and in earth and everything in between, said, that's nice, I'm paraphrasing, you could have no power at all unless my Father, God Almighty in heaven, gave it to you. None. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. It's an understatement. More accurately, we might say from this time on, Pilate intensified his efforts to release Jesus because he had been going back and forth over this, arguing, I can find no fault in him. What has he done? Why are you doing this? He's tried over and over again, but now he really wants to get out of it. It had been his desire all along, but once again, not because he cared about Jesus, but because he didn't want to be bothered. He didn't want there to be any civil unrest that could cost him his precious little job. And as Pilate intensified his efforts to release Jesus, the Jews intensified their insistence on his execution. That's why I say this, this last paragraph that I just read to you, this is crunch time, folks. It's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. And it's either going to happen right now or it's not going to happen. And of course, we know it happened. And by the way, I would add this. It didn't happen because Pilate said so or because the Jews said so. It happened because God had determined this from before eternity passed. It was his plan. 
the Jews, verse 12, chapter 12, or excuse me, verse, verse 12, but the Jews, after Pilate not wanting to do this, but the Jews continued, we might add, to cry out all the more, we might add, saying, if you let this man go, you're not, a, you're not Caesar's friend. Remember when the word friend meant something? You're not Caesar's friend. And here's why. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. I can't help but wonder. It's probably in vain, and it might be a, just a vapor of a thought, but I think it's interesting when James, later on in the New Testament, says whoever makes himself a friend of the world it makes himself an enemy of God if James was thinking about these words that were uttered against his brother. Luke 23, 23 adds this. Not only if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Verse 23 of Luke 23 adds, but with loud shouts, loud shouts, loud shouts. They were screaming. It was a fevered pitch at this point. With loud shouts, they insistently, listen to these words from the scriptures. I'm not making these up. They, in, they uh, insistently demanded. These are strong words. They speak of great passion, great pathos, great determination, a desire that they were not going to let Go unfulfilled. With loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he, Christ, be crucified, and their shouts, listen, prevailed. With who? With Pilate. I believe these words penetrated and petrified Pilate's heart. More than anything else that had been said, about Jesus, because before the Jews just kept leveling charges against Jesus, leveling charges against you, but now they're leveling a charge against Pilate. Oh yeah? You won't do this for us? Well, we'll just see about that. I think more than any of the crowd's previous demands, as seen in verse 13, this made a big difference. What of verse 13? When Pilate therefore heard that saying... When Pilate therefore heard those words, he was done. Why? Well, forgive me for being redundantly redundant, but Pilate's chief ambition was not to lose his position. We might say, just like elected officials in our day. He wasn't elected. He was appointed, but just like elected officials in our day, they tell you all that they plan to do, but then once they're elected, they only have one plan, get reelected. That's it. And if you believe otherwise, bless you for being so sweet and naive. And there were two surefire ways that a guy in a position like Pilate could lose his position. One, is if he failed to squelch civil unrest. He didn't want to send out the media to say it's mostly peaceful. He needed to stop it or he could lose his job. The other thing which didn't really play into this but was he needed to keep the taxes rolling in. So when the Jewish mob said, if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend, Pilate, was scared. The mob, listen to me, the, law, the mob was threatening to charge Pilate with insurrection against Rome. One writer captured what was happening with these words. I read these and thought, yep, that pretty much sums it up. I'm quoting, the Jewish leaders said, if you release this man, you're no friend of the emperor. But Pilate understood immediately that such a statement, listen, implied much more than it actually expressed. That statement implied much more than it actually expressed. It implied, we will lodge a complaint against you. We will tell the emperor that you condone high treason against the emperor's government, and that you have released a man who was guilty of sedition, 
and he'll allow himself to be called the king of Israel. We will accuse you of softness towards rebels. Then where will you be? I think that's pretty insightful as to what was going on here. And what does all this say, by the way, about the character of the Jewish leaders? They had, Listen, you know this, but i got to remind you, they had absolutely no love nor loyalty for Rome. They weren't concerned about somebody bucking against Rome. They were constantly bucking against Rome. They had a, a whole party, if you will, of people. You know, they had the Sadducees, the, Heres- the, the, uh, the Herodians, all these different ones. They had the Zealots who were basically terrorist assassins who went around killing Romans. They didn't have any feelings of tenderness towards Rome, but they were willing to lie about Pilate, to destroy Pilate, because they were bound and determined to execute who? Their own Messiah. Their king. Remember, that's been largely what the conversation with Pilate and Jesus was about, was about, are you a king? What kind of king are you? He was their king. He is their king, as he is the king of all that exists. Not only was he their Messiah and their king, but they wanted to execute the Son of God. The Son of God, who, by the way, was sent from heaven to save them. The ironies that are happening in this whole business are just beyond what anybody could fabricate or make up. Matthew adds in Matthew chapter 27, verse 25, listen to this, all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Now, we might cluck our tongues and wag our heads and say, what fools, but what chilling words they spoke, not knowing what they were actually asking for. Not from Pilate, not from the Caesar, but from God. Chilling words. These remind me of the parable In Luke 20, it's also in Matthew, but in Luke chapter 20, Jesus told a parable about some sharecroppers. You remember it, I trust. Some of you do anyway. Some sharecroppers who worked for the landowner, the vineyard owner. And they were supposed to, as sharecroppers, give a portion of the harvest to the owner. And when the owner would send his messengers to collect what was his from the sharecroppers, the sharecroppers rejected the master by rejecting the master's messengers. And then finally, the master reasoned, well, I'll send my son. Surely they'll respect him. Did they? In verse 14 of Luke 20, Jesus puts these words into the mouths of the sharecroppers. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. And then in verse 15 of Luke 20, they carried out their plan. It says, so they cast him, the son, out of the vineyard and killed him. Jesus, concluding the same verse, verse 15, makes this statement. Therefore, therefore what? Because these sharecroppers rejected their master by rejecting his messengers, and then not only rejected but murdered his son in order to do away with him to have their own vineyard or so they hoped. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? In Matthew's gospel, 
We read that the Jewish religious leaders who were listening to this parable, some of them answered. But in Luke's version, Jesus answered the question for them with these words. What will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Here's why I bring this parable up. Jesus taught this very parable that same week to those same people. That very week to those very people. Now these same people were inviting God's judgment on themselves and on their children. Think of how chilling these words are. Let me remind you of them once again. His blood, the blood of this rabbi, the blood of this Nazarene, the blood of Jesus. Let his blood be on us and on our children. How different those who believe would pray similar but altogether different words. Let his blood cover us. and our children. And big surprise, in some measure, his blood has been on them and on their children. I say that because historically from the, the very beginning, the majority of the very first Christians were Jewish. But not long after that, and ever since, very few Jewish people have trusted Jesus as their Messiah. Not just very few, because there's very few Jews in the world. They're a tiny minority in the world. As a matter of fact, we might say they, they could be the most persecuted minority in human history because they're such a minority, and yet they're so hated and blamed for everything. But even what percentage of them that believes in Jesus is very small and historically has been. They haven't trusted in their own Messiah and his blood has been on them and their children and their children's children and their children after them and those after them and so on and so forth. I can only say how terribly sad that in the same way for the centuries that transpired that we call the Old Testament and the Jews knew who their God was. Remember Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, we know, the Jews know who we worship. But for centuries, for millennia before Jesus came, There was a delusion on the nations, on the Gentile nations. The Jews knew who God was and the Gentiles didn't. And since Jesus has risen from the dead, and since about halfway through the first century, the delusion has been on Israel. How sad. They reject their own God. They reject their own Savior. They reject their own King. Verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Here's what these words really communicate, I think. Real simple. That was the last straw. Jesus had a very unsuspecting ally or advocate in Pilate who for the wrong reasons but nonetheless was seeking to get Jesus released. But Pilate who was too weak morally to do the right thing even though he knew Jesus was not worthy of death he said it himself. 
Though he didn't want to execute Jesus of Nazareth, when he heard the people's threats, he lacked the moral courage to do the right thing. And as we would say in the vernacular, Pilate caved. He caved in. He buckled. He fell apart. He was too scared for his own position. Put it this way, Pilate was interested in preserving his job at the expense of an innocent man's life. What neither Pilate nor the Jews nor even the disciples knew but what Jesus obviously did know is that what was about to happen had been planned by the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from before time began in eternity past. I won't say that's the only reason, but I think that's one really big reason why Jesus never said a word at this point. The angel Gabriel said, You shall name it, call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. And Jesus silently was saying, and I'm fixing to do it right now. While Pilate was about to execute the Son of God to save his pathetic job, the sinless Son of God was about to lay down his life and, don't forget, rise again from the dead in order to save the souls of sinners. Think about that. Think about that. And as we think about that, may our hearts and minds tremble. at what a quasi-powerful man will do compared to what the all-powerful Son of God would do. Verse 14, now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about, keyword, about the sixth hour. There have been differences of opinion about the meaning of those words. First, regarding the day, and second, regarding the hour. Two questions that come up in this debate. Which day of the week was Jesus crucified in order to account for being dead three days before being resurrected? It's a good question. Number two, at what hour was Jesus crucified? I ask that question because Matthew, Luke, and John all say this happened about the sixth hour. Mark says it happened at the third hour. Well, that's proof that the whole thing is a lie. There was never a man named Jesus. He never died. He never rose. And we don't have to worry about standing before our Creator because, after all, we think we're so smart we found a mistake in the Bible. Well, how do we answer this without getting sidetracked into details that, to me, are just fine being left to remain a mystery? Let me give the simplest explanation, and it explains the answer to both questions about the day and the hour. Number one, Jesus was crucified and was dead for three days. We good with that? Number two, which day and at what hour does not change what happened, to whom, or for what purpose? Wrangling over non-essential details can be interesting but it's far from essential. And trust me, smarter men than me, more educated men than me can enter this debate and both sides can make wonderful, convincing arguments. Trust me. Trust me when I tell you that those who reject Christ in the Bible over such chronological and numerical difficulties would most certainly reject Christ in the Bible if there were no difficulties. These things are a camouflage for unbelief. That's all they are. And they, they grow out of 
a little pile of pride. Huh. We found something in the book. Well, actually, most of the people that cite these things, they didn't find it. They heard some other skeptic scoffer say this, and they think they're so smart because they can re repeat it. Can you imagine standing before God and finding out, uh-oh, I'm standing before God? Yeah, but was it at the sixth or the third hour? I rest my case. Last part of 14. And he, that is Pilate, said to the Jews, one last little, behold your king. I don't think it's possible that these words could have been spoken in any other way than in bitter irony, in anger, and in contempt. To quote once a great theologian of our generation, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> That's... The Jews no doubt hated, think about it, they hated, these Jewish religious leaders, hated being told that Jesus was their king. I mean, that was smoke in the eyes, it was salt in the wound to say, behold your king. They rejected him as their king, and they demanded that Jesus be executed for claiming to be the king of the Jews and indeed the son of God. But the real reason they wanted Jesus dead, I believe this with all my heart, the real reason they wanted Jesus dead is that Jesus threatened to demolish the stranglehold on their power and authority. Jesus was a threat to them and to their religious charade. So, verse 15, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. You know, when you're, when you have no position, when you have no argument, you just call names, right? You just yell louder. You just threaten violence. Because you got nothing in terms of anything worth saying. These foolish, foolish and angry chants, I think in some way, were tantamount to them without realizing it, looking to heaven and begging God, condemn us. A.W. Pink observed, well, Verse 15b, Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? Again, he grinds in the king part. Pink observed this for the last time, and I think this is an interesting observation. For the last time, Pilate put the question to the Jews to give them one last chance of relenting. The bitter irony, in bitter irony, Pilate asked, Shall I then really crucify your king? Is this really your wish and your desire? I would add one thing to what, Pil to what uh, Pink observed. He says these were Pilate's words. I would say God put these words in Pilate's mouth. Why? Because God is so gracious he was giving them one last time to repent or else to persist in their path and consign themselves to God's wrath. The question was put to them, are you sure you want to do this? And sin had so blinded them that they were sure. Chapter, verse 15 continues, the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. You know, when you're in a hole, the way to get out is to first stop digging. 
and they just keep digging themselves in. To understand this statement, we have no king but Caesar. We must remember that regardless of which of the Jewish kings were reigning in Israel, think about the Old Testament, the kings, from Saul on, or regardless of which foreign country the Jews were currently exiled in, because that's a part of their history, was being carted off by their enemies, the people of God have but one king, God. And the history of the people of God is just interwoven with episode after episode of denying him as being their king. Not just here. This is their history. These words here are no less than a denunciation of God's kingship and his rule over him. But this wasn't new for Israel. What was their demand in 1 Samuel chapter 8? Give us a king. What kind of king? Like you? Give us a king who is a man after your heart? No, give us a king just like the kings of the Gentiles. Did They did not do this. Did they not do this repeatedly? Whenever they were in trouble, think about the history of Israel if you're a student of Old Testament Kings and Chronicles. Every time it seems they were in trouble, when they were outnumbered, when an enemy was too much for them, did they, did they instinctively cry out to God? Very few times, many more times, they hired the Syrians, they hired the Assyrians, they hired the Egyptians, they hired pagans to protect them, which was nothing other than saying, we have no king in heaven, we have only these kings here who we can pay to get our heads off the block. In every instance of hiring foreign armies to defend them, they were only trusting in human kings while rejecting their God. And you know what? Lest we, again, cluck our tongues and wag our heads at them, do we not do the same whenever we put our trust in politicians? in human wisdom, in money, in medicine? Are all those things necessarily bad? No, but when those are the things in which we put our trust to the exclusion of going first and foremost to God, are we not saying we have no king but fill in the blank? Verse 16 concludes this section, Then he delivered him to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. You know, the Jews were given this one last chance. They had one last chance. They didn't, listen, they didn't merely miss the chance. They boldly and intentionally rejected it. Trusting in human government. I think the irony of ironies, and we'll just conclude with this thought. The irony of ironies is that Jesus was not merely led away to be executed. He was led away to save his people from our sins. precisely the way the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit planned it before anything else was created. You want to talk about love. You want to talk about God having a plan. Oh. Father in heaven, thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his kindness his willingness to do what he did in order to save our sorry souls, including praying for the very ones who nailed him to the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you a million times, a billion times without end. Thank you for sending Jesus to save us and for doing it in the 
the manner and fashion in which he did. Thank you for your kindness. Amen. Thank you.